between animals and humans, and that we have this built environment. Um, <clears throat> how walkable is your neighborhood? Um, and then another example of, a, of an exposure would be uh, climate change. And then we have, you know, our the outcomes that we think about. So just I just have a few examples of outcomes there. So there's a high level of public concern. The public is really concerned about the environment and its relation to human health. But I think that's especially true for people who are American Indian and Alaska Native because of their traditional ties to the land. But there are some real challenges um, when we think about um, measuring these exposure and outcome relationships. A lot of these chemical agents haven't been well, well characterized. Um, because really small increases in risk, you can need a long follow-up time and or a large sample size. Um, a lot of the environmental exposures, the concern is on the outcome of chronic diseases, um, which may have multiple uh, causes. There may not be just one cause for a chronic disease, but it may be nutrition and a chemical exposure and something that we don't even know how to measure yet. Um, there can be a lack of resources to measure exposures. Um, we have health outcomes that can take years and years. Most of those chronic diseases take a long time to develop. Um, and sometimes a health, something, there can be a legitimate, uh, I mean, well, there can be a legitimate um, exposure outcome relationship with only a very small number of people exposed. And um, how you um, balance a small number of people exposed with limited public health dollars. So another kind of concept that I want us to carry forward as we're thinking about the um, national, state, and local level data is the idea of both proximal and distal exposures. And I think proximal factors are the things that we kind of traditionally think about in epidemiology. You know, you've got chemicals in the air, the water, the soil, those, those radioactive um, the radi radiation, we've got infectious agents, we've got weather patterns, we've got those zoonotic diseases, and those directly cause disease. But then we also have, um, which I think is becoming more and more um, apparent, and there's a lot more um, interest in presenting data this way, on distal exposures that occur farther back in that causal chain um, and act via a number of intermediate causes. So examples of those more distal factors can be the built environment um, or climate change. So um, now I'm going to um, pass the microphone back to Lyle, and Lyle's going to be talking with you about national data sources. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to categorize these uh, by the type of data, starting with uh, data available through the Environmental Protection Agency first. Um, so the, the point of this is to kind of run through data that we were able to find um, that was nationally available and kind of introduce you how you can use that data um, and what kind of data it is. So we'll be thinking about it in terms of exposure and outcome, as Amy mentioned before. Uh, so the first one I kind of want to show you is this air quality index. Um, by following that link, you can, um, you'll be greeted to a form like this. And I want everyone to know that all these resources that we are uh, sharing are provided in the resources um, for this presentation, so you can get a list of those as well. And so for the air quality index, you can fill out um, this form to select by year and geographic area, either by state, city, or county. And here we have chosen to use Bernalillo County as an example. So once you've selected your parameters, the report generates um, a table such as this. Um, and it shows the total days an air quality index is measured by monitoring sites, how that value was categorized. So there's the scale. Um, of which is determined whether that day was categorized as good, moderate, unhealthy for sensitive groups, unhealthy or very unhealthy. But it also provides the maximum and median air quality index values for that year and how many days that air pollutants were classified as the main pollutant. So, for example, here it shows that ozone was the main pollutant for 253 days in Bernalillo County. 
in 2018. And this is a good example of that exposure data. Uh, the next EPA resource uh, is the Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool. Um, this is a pretty useful resource in that you do not need any additional software like uh, ESRI's ArcGIS to use. Um, all the mapping data is provided, and you can select which maps, map layers to display. So here we have a map of Detroit uh, showing the percentage of American community population using 2012 to 2016 American Community Survey data. And as I can show here, you can overlay that map with other information, such as hazardous sites, as shown here. <clears throat> other options you can, you can include are Superfund sites, toxic releases, water discharges, air pollution, and brownfields. Um, so this is a really good example of creating a map for you um, for your area that you just want to show basic information on exposures. Now the next um, resource I want to talk about is Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Resources. Um, the first one listed here is CDC Wonder. Uh, for anyone else who's not familiar, this is a great resource for health data in general. Um, but we also find that they offer some information on environmental health as well as you can see here. And I want to highlight two for you, the first one being uh, data on daily fine particulate matter. Uh, so by clicking that link shown, you will find a form to fill out, which may look confusing at first. Um, but for the most important thing to note is that you can group results by county and by year. And as we have here, we have indicated that we are interested in looking at the state of Colorado. Uh, there's more information to stratify and analyze by, but this is the main information we want to showcase for the purpose of this presentation. Um, so once you complete the form, it will produce a table that looks like this. And as you can see, it shows the counties in Colorado on the left. It's only the three, um, the top ones. Um, and then the average fine particulate matter values for each year, the right. Um, and one interesting thing to note, just by looking at this output was that for each county, the average fine particulate matter increased from 20, or 2003 to 2011, quite substantially. Um, yeah, so this is another source of exposure data that you can utilize. And the next feature highlighted from CDC Wonder is the National Environmental Public Health Tracking Network. Um, this is similar to that mapping tool I showed you before, but provides information at the county level on content such as air quality, asthma, lead exposure, climate change, and drinking water. And here we are showing the percent of children under three who are tested for lead exposure in the state of Texas. And these are really useful just to, to get a map of, of your area and, and get a visual for any presentation or any um, anything that you're preparing that, that needs um, some visual to show uh, an exposure. So the next CDC resource provided um, is the Social Vulnerability Index. This is provided in a data or documentation format, and the data is given in a shape file for use in a mapping software tool. So the previous two mapping resources I showed you don't need any stat or any um, ArcGIS, but this one you would need um, that software tool to use. And what it shows is that by census tract level, information determined by the CDC on social vulnerability. So that includes socioeconomic status, household composition, and disability, minority status and language, and housing and transportation. Now those are broken down further into the specific um, variables provided by American Community Survey. But for there, for only for the years 2016, 2014, and 2010. Now, a limitation of this data is that for minority status, they group all racial groups that are non-white into just the group of minority um, as a as a indicator of social vulnerability. So you'd have to go out and get that data to add to this. Um, but the benefit of this is that is that it compiles the rest of the data for you instead of you having to download each table from uh, American Fact Finder individually. 
And finally, the last CDC source I wanted to highlight is the National Vital Statistics System. This is probably our most useful data system for data on birth and death. And in the context of environmental health, this is a great resource for the outcome data that we want to link to exposures. Ideally, we'd want to link them, but um, that's not always possible. But this is a good resource for that outcome information. And as I mentioned before, um, UIHI is granted this data as a public health authority, even though it is restricted use. So that would depend on your organization's ability to acquire this data. But um, that is something that we are able to, to acquire. And the last type of national level data I wanted to describe was national survey data. Um, and this is only a couple, but there are a lot of sources out there. Um, and these were some that I found that can provide some context on health behaviors as it relates to <coughs> environmental health. So the first one listed is the National Health Interview Survey conducted by the CDC. And they have survey data categorized by family, household, injury episode, person, child, and adult. As you can see, you can access the variable summary and frequencies, the raw data, and they even provide sample SAS, SPSS, or SPADA statements in order to analyze the data more properly. So it makes it a little easier for you to kind of work through on your own if you do have some uh, software tools already. The only information that I found that had to do with the specific outcome that we may be looking for was whether a child in the household households have ever been told they had asthma, whether they still have asthma, or whether they had an asthma episode or attack in the past 12 months. Um, there is a race variable involved. However, it, or there is a race variable that lists American and Alaskan Native alone. However, the only geographic variable they provide is region of the US. Um, so that's just one of those limitations for uh, surveys. And you'll notice there's with a lot of these data sources is that there are trade-offs, which relate back to that institutional mistreatment that often erases uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives from the data. And the last uh, source, survey source listed here is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES. And the benefit of this uh, site is that it's easy to navigate. You can um, easily review the survey methodology and search for variables that you may uh, be interested in. Um, and they also have the data by years ready for download that have questions on asthma, housing characteristics, and exposure to volatile toxicants. And in addition to the survey instrument, they also conduct lab tests on biological specimens to track variables like arsenic, uh, exposure, cholesterol, pesticides, HPV, and many more. Now, as you can see here, um, they lump the racial categories into an other for American Indian and Alaska Natives. And this is just another example of the challenges that we face um, in reporting on the health and well-being of urban natives. Um, like I said, many of these sources have flaws, which is why we try to supplement that data with um, other sources, including those from state and local um, counties when available. So next, Amy will discuss how we kind of go about doing that using King County and Seattle, Washington as an example. Yeah, and the state of Washington. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, state data sources. Um, so the first uh, state data source that I'm going to talk about is just like us, or perhaps like you, uh, the state can also get grants for time-limited projects. Um, and um, so all these examples that I've provided are from Washington State, just simply because we had to choose, um, a, we just wanted to choose one state to limit ourselves. Um, you'll probably want to go on the State Department of Health website under environmental health or environmental health data and kind of investigate what's available. This was an interesting grant that was given to CDC um, to the state of Washington for five years. Um, and they did biomonitoring. So they actually tested people's urine um, and drinking water uh, from all around the state to provide a state representative sample. Um, that urine was tested for heavy metals, pesticides, and plastics-related compounds. 
and then the drinking water was tested for heavy metals. So this is an example of thinking about like what kind of exposure data is available. And then a second part of this grant was uh, to look at residents of subsidized housing in King County. So King County is the uh, county where Seattle is located. Uh, Seattle and Bellevue are kind of like the two big cities. Uh, and so in there, they did um, urine testing for pesticides and plastics-related compounds. And then they also did, uh, they talked to residents to find out uh, if they cooked in plastic, um, what kind of beauty and skincare products they use, and what kind of pesticides they use in their homes. Um, and so this uh, data is available uh, from the State Department of Health um, for that time-limited period. Their funding ended, and so they had to stop collecting the data. Um, and it's not available except with the exception of this uh, re re residents of subsidized housing in King County. It's not available by county or by race. Uh, but it does give you a general idea of, the, um, of some of that exposure data for people in the state of Washington. Um, a second data source uh, that's kind of interesting that may not be available uh, at your state, or if it is available, it's not always available through the Department of Health. Sometimes it's through a hospital association um, or some sort of healthcare um, monitoring group in your state. But in Washington State, we have this comprehensive hospital abstract and reporting system, which is called CHARS. And that's record level data on inpatient and observation hospital stays. It has to be reported to the state. Um, and that information is available uh, by both county and race. Um, about the race um, data is not amazing. 12% of it's uh, missing. And we know that there's problems with racial classification because a lot of times this is the people at the front desk checking someone in and deciding what someone's race is. Um, but when I did look at the data, there were um, over 11,000 inpatient and over 1,500 observation visits um, that by people uh, who were identified as being American Indian Alaska Native in 2017. And so this is the kind of data that you could look, use to look at outcome measurements. Um, and so what the state does use this data to look at hospitalizations for asthma. Um, so if you are interested in other outcomes, um, this type of inpatient, it, it's not outpatient or ED visits, but it is useful for inpatient visits and observation visits. Um, this is the type of data that you might be able to find at your state level. Um, the next example is, uh, a health, the Healthy Youth Survey. I know that there's a survey very similar to this in California called the California Healthy Kids Survey. Um, and this is a complex sample survey that's administered to students generally in public schools. Private schools have the option to opt in. Um, in uh, students in grades 6, 8, 10, and 12. That's also to give longitudinal data. It's administered every other year. Um, and you can find information by, um, it's actually made available to the school at the school level, um, but we, because we're a public health authority, we also have access to this and we can look at it by county and by race. Um, it has a limited use um, for outcome measurement um, because of the types of questions that are asked. It's generally asking um, a lot about um, family support, um, and um, do you have enough uh, food? Um, and uh, a few other questions like uh, alcohol, marijuana use. Um, but there, there are also questions um, on if you have, it's asked of the, of the youth, um, if you have asthma, and if you have asthma, if you miss school due to your asthma. Um, so it is useful for that outcome measurement. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, and most states have uh, a similar type of youth survey that's asked of students. Um, another example of a state-level data resource is the Washington State Cancer Registry. Um, this is used to count the number and types of cancer in both adult and children. You can look at information that's available by both county and race. Um, you can see this is mostly for outcome data. It's, it's, 
there's no attribution in this cancer registry to, of a death to a specific environmental exposure. Um, but you can get from the, uh, they do, the exposure data that is available um, is from um, death certificates um, where the industry and the occupation of the decedent is available. And this gets used um, in Washington State, especially uh, to look at people um, who are employed at Hanford, which is our super fun uh, cleanup site for um, nuclear um, weapons material. That's currently the people work there and it's being cleaned up. Um, and every state has an active cancer registry. Um, finally, uh, we have the behavioral risk factor surveillance system which is also a complex sample survey administered by each state. Um, there's three uh, types of questions asked on the survey. There's the core questions, um, which CDC, so CDC provides the funding to the state to ask these questions. It's state level data, um, and it's administered by the state, but it's been used by CDC to get national data. So there's a set of core questions that are asked by all states in that particular year. Um, and then there's optional modules, which are standardized modules. So if a state chooses to use that module, you can combine that state's data with another state's data to get um, measurements um, for that specific question. And then there's also state added questions, which are questions like specific to that state. Um, an example Washington State and a state added question as we had state added questions on uh, marijuana. But the BRFS data, um, it, it is available by county and race. Um, the American Indian Alaska data, data, so data by race, it may not be uh, statistically stable due to small numbers um, of people surveyed. It can depend on the state, and it can also depend on the state sampling frame because some states do oversampling um, specifically so that they, they actually ask more questions of people. They try to obtain uh, responses from more people that are American Indian and Alaska Native so that they can have a statistically um, stable uh, set of responses from that, from American Indians and Alaska Natives. And that's something that um, you would have to find out from your um, state. It also has, kind of similar to the Healthy Youth Survey, it has pretty limited data as far as environmental um, ex environmental outcomes. Um, one of the main things that it is used nationally for is asthma. But again, you have to take a look at those optional modules and those state added questions, and there can be other information on there. Um, finally, I, I think that when Lyle, Lyle showed that you can see the national um, CDC tracking network, um, and CDC actually funds at virtually every state also um, a state level tracking tool. And um, what's available in that tracking tool um, depends on the state. Um, but you can see the list of topics here that are available through the Washington uh, Tracking Network. And just like the CDC, the National Tracking Network, um, most of this information gets provided in the form of maps. Um, where you don't need additional mapping software. You're basically just you're um, choosing to see exposures and you're choosing to see or you're choosing to see different exposures mapped by location or different outcomes mapped by location. Um, and in this an example is you can look at much of this information um, um, by what you would be doing is you would be overlapping, um, say for instance, radon. You can look at specific counties and their radon, um, their radon rankings, and then you can also look at the proportion of American Indian Alaska Natives in that county. So it's somewhat limited, um, but at the same time, it, it gives you both um, exposure and outcome data that you can map and look at at the same time. And you can see the list of topics, and it may depend on your the tracking network and your um, state what's available. Um, we, in the Washington Tracking Network, they actually have a lot of um, information about the built environment um, as well in a publicly accessible way. And this is actually accessible to the public as well as to health researchers, so it's um, right on their website.
Um, and then I looked at data sources for King County. Um, and actually, it seems like when we looked, most of the data that's presented by the county um, is, in, is environmental exposure or outcome data that's collected at the state or national level. There isn't a lot of county level data collected um, in King County. Um, the main focus of environmental public health um, seems to be more on like the day-to-day -day operations of environmental health, uh, safe food, um, pest management, proper disposal of waste and to toxic substances, um, good sanitation. Um, but we did find that in King County um, that there is, uh, a, there is, uh, uh, they have an assessment policy development and evaluation unit which produces county level reports. And some of those reports um, use the national and state generated environmental health data um, to produce these county level reports. And then they also offer uh, consultation to design a custom data analysis. Um, and I'm not saying many uh, large uh, county or large city health departments um, may offer some, something like this, but I actually want to like kind of bring this back to the Urban Indian uh, Health Institute and let you know that this is something that you don't have to go to your um, local uh, health department for, and that we can actually uh, help you do custom data analysis, or if you have specific data questions, that we can help you answer those or find out and find out what kind of resources are available. So you don't need to fit it into that um, two-hour of free time that they offer in the county or $110 after, $110 an hour after. We will actually, this is why we exist, is to provide that service um, to the Urban Indian Health Programs and organization uh, and, organ and network. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, I just wanted to urge you um, to contact us and, and to use us as a resource. And that concludes our um, presentation today. Um, here is our contact information. Um, if you, you can email um, any requests into that info at urbanindianhealthinstitute.org and then um, they'll go from there and they'll be sent to um, an epidemiologist who can work with you um, on your any data need that you may have or question that we could help you out with. So, thank you. Yeah, we want to thank everyone uh, for for joining. If you have any questions, we, we have time to, to answer any questions that you have. Um, so please reach out. Hi, this is Buck from Sakui. Um, I know you guys mentioned earlier that uh, the previous webinar was located on your website. Uh, wh where can I find that at? Hi, this is Andrew. Um, you can find it um, on mikui.org slash environmental health. Um, yeah. And it should also be on, if you go to our landing page on the website, um, and click the section that says videos. Um, that'll also have a list of all of our recent webinars with the recording. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to mention to anyone on the line, um, if you would like to ask a question, um, you can either type it into the chat box. Um, I also opened up all of the lines on the computer. Um, so if you click on your telephone and say connect my audio, um, you should be able to speak as well. Um, it looks like we got some questions coming in, but um, while we wait, I just wanted to reiterate, um, thank you all for coming. Um, if you are from an urban Indian organization, um, I want to reiterate it's a really good opportunity if you have questions about environmental health um, or you're interested in getting data, um, as mentioned, the contacts are all available for this.
Um, and also, if you um, are from an urban Indian organization, um, your executive director should have received a survey link about your organization's priorities around ch childhood environmental health, um, partnerships you may have built to deal with that topic, and the supports that you need. Um, so please reach out um, complete those surveys. Um, it will help the CUI communicate to the CDC and also to other partners um, the great work that's already being done in that area and the variety of needs we have in different cities. Um, lastly, um, when the call ends, you'll be connected to an evaluation. We ask you to please fill that out because it helps us um, plan future webinars. Um, and it looks like we had a question come in. Say, is the PA your organization provides limited to urban Indian health programs? Um, uh, yeah, I can answer that question. Uh, it, it's not limited to urban Indian health programs specifically, but um, as long as it's like a social health organization that's involved with um, or looking for information or data on urban natives, um, that's something that we can provide. Thank you. So, for example, um, we've also yeah. done like data requests from representatives or senators from the United States Congress, um, as well as um, social organizations that are looking into California Healthy Kids Survey. <laughs> um, so, it's kind of a wide variety. It depends on the um, data requests or technical assistance. Thank you. Um, and on the Mercury end, um, just we um, provide technical assistance um, on a few things as well, um, less so on the epidemiology. Um, but um, the PA we provide is generally um, open. There's a few things that are specific to urban Indian health programs um, where there's a membership link to so some of the resources we provide on our website. But by and large, things like today um, are open and by um, we have a second question coming in saying, does this include state QIOs? Um, and I will forward that one over to you guys at the Urban Indian Health Institute. Yeah, so just looking at whether we have the correct definition for QIOs, quality improvement organizations, I'm not entirely sure if, if that includes that. I mean, it depends on what the technical assistance or data request is. Um, I would reach out using the email that's provided, and and, uh, and we can have our director uh, look at that request specifically. Thank you for asking. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to give it one more minute in case there are any more questions. Um, but otherwise, thank you all for coming. Um, and I will close up the meeting in just about a minute, and you should all automatically be forwarded to an evaluation room. You can also feel free to reach out to us outside of this format as well to, for any questions that you may have. Um, we can also provide our emails in the chat um, so that you can have access to that as well. Oh, yeah. And um, make sure to download the um, resources that were provided, although those will also be spot, um, in the follow-up email with the video as well. Um, and as well as all our contacts. Um, but other than that, thank you all for coming. Um, it'll just be a minute, and then we'll go to the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you.